But let me kick us off. It says your questions answered about big behaviors. It didn't say all of your questions answered, but the majority of the questions that you ask will be able to answer. Um, and certainly for anything that comes up where it may not be in our range or our, our, our field of work, we can certainly at least try to direct you to a resource. Rhonda, let's move ahead. We're going to tell you a little bit about Momentus. Um, many of you are probably familiar with us, but this is the spiel we, we mention every time uh, because we really want you to get to know us more and more. And each time we talk about what we do, you probably are hearing something different and that's okay because when different ones of us explain it, you're probably picking up something. But Momentus Institute was 100 years old in 2020. So we um, have been around for a minute and many of you probably um, that have been in education and therapeutic services for a while that are familiar with Momentus know us from our original footprint, which is therapeutic services. Um, and this is our um, oldest arm of the org. And through our therapy center, we serve about 6,000 individuals and families a year. We do individual and group therapy. therapy. And one of the, the um, areas and features that we're noted for is that we do family therapy, which is really important. Uh, because we believe in systems work. We also have a school. We um, serve pre-K three through fifth grade. We have about 248 students at the Momentus School. And this is a laboratory school. So eventually when it's safe enough for us to open again, we'll start back doing tours. So if you haven't visited our campus, it will be great to have you join us. And that's something we can all look forward to eventually. And then our third arm of service is our research and training arm. And that department is called Innovation and Impact. And Rhonda and I both, both serve in that department. And this is the arm through which we do training. And also we pair all of our um, work within our school and therapy with research so that we can share that out with professionals like you who are doing great work in the field. Um, for our next slide, this is simply just our mission in a nutshell, social emotional health for all children so they can reach their full potential. We believe that it is through um, social emotional uh, perspective and focus and pairing that with rigorous academics that we help school children reach their potential, but we're also interested in making change makers. We want kids to know that beyond school, they have the capacity to change their communities and their lives and the lives of others. And so um, our definition of social emotional health, because many of you are familiar with social emotional learning. And so as we think about learning, that's one aspect of our social emotional capacity, but overall social emotional health is really our ability to understand and manage, manage our emotions, reactions, and relationships. If you've been to some of our training and you plan to come to future ones, you'll hear us talk a little bit about our, this, our stair step model, which helps us really focus in on what specifically um, we, we use as skill based training to get to this capacity to do this management. So, Rhonda's going to take over from here for the next few slides and really just kind of give us a grounding in um, some basics and big behavior, and then we'll get to our QA. Right. And um, as Tina's already mentioned, but I know there's been um, a few people joined since she mentioned it. If you have questions during the um, during the, the little seminar that we're doing here, just drop those in the chat box um, and we will try to get to those um, in our Q&A session. So when we think about this definition that you have right here, um, we really know that this is important for children in, in order for them to do well in school and in life. And so it's really important that we come up with a solid definition of what is social emotional health. But let's go ahead and start talking about big behaviors. Um, and before we really put the big in front of it, let's just talk about behavior. And it's important to realize that behavior is simply communication. So um, lots of us on this call are probably parents or aunts and uncles, and we've, um, we've cared for young children, especially you know, like a newborn, and obviously they're not going to talk, but you can tell by the way they're acting or the way that they are crying, whatever behaviors that a, a baby brings into the world, you can tell they're communicating something. You know, I'm hungry, I'm tired, I'm cold, whatever it is. So we know from the very youngest of ages that behavior is communication. And when we can understand the language, we can support the child. So remembering that behavior is communication um, is really super important. And so let's think about um, what kinds of behaviors um, or not what kinds of behaviors, but what is being communicated. And sometimes big behaviors communicate some pretty um, 
recognizable patterns. And so big behaviors sometimes communicate that I need to be heard. As, as a child, I need somebody to hear me or I need somebody to see me. Um, oftentimes when children kind of pester, um, you know, I was, I was at the grocery store the, the other day and there was a lady in the checkout line and she was on her phone, um, like most other people in the grocery store. And her kid was literally jumping up and down, poking her, jumping up and poking her, jumping up and poking her. And this is probably a four-year-old. And, uh, you know, I don't know that what he really wanted, but he wanted to be seen and he wanted to be heard. And she was pretty irritated by that. So understanding that communica uh, behavior is communication. So being seen, being heard, sometimes big behavior means um, I want to be included. I, I'm, I'm feeling excluded and, and left out. And it's really important for me to belong. Sometimes it means um, I need to feel respected. So in some way, my dignity has been... Um, has been attacked or um, not recognized. I don't feel um, like I have any agency in this in this group I'm in and I'm not respected. Um, going along with that, sometimes big behaviors communicate the need to feel valued. So, you know, you have kids who may be working in small groups and they don't listen to each other. And one kid can't take that very well. And he might just, um, you know, shove his chair over and walk, walk out of the room or, you know, walk to a, a different section of the room. And that's big behavior that might be communicating. You know what? I'm not valued. Nobody cares about what I say or what I think or what I feel. And that's valid. That's a real, um, a real need that somebody has. And, and finally, um, Another real pattern that we see for kids when we're looking at big behaviors is um, I'm, I'm communicating the need to feel protected. Oftentimes, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but um, oftentimes when kids are exhibiting big behaviors, they do so because they're feeling vulnerable. And vulnerable um, individuals, kids or adults, need to feel like they're protected. So um, I don't know if you maybe wrote down this list, but all of these are very much connected to each other. Um, it's hard to protect somebody that you don't value. Uh, it's hard to um, value somebody who you don't wanna hear. So all of those really are pretty much connected, but big behaviors often communicate exactly these, um, these needs. So let's talk about big behavior. So when we talk about what is a big behavior, it's, it's important to kind of come to some definitions. What I know is that all teachers are different. You know, you have different levels of experience in the field. You've been trained differently. You're working with different um, grade levels of kids, ages of kids, different content. And so there is no one size fits all when it comes to um, teachers' perceptions of big behaviors. What might irritate, um, you know, Miss Jones in a classroom might be funny to me or vice versa. So we wanted to bring a solid definition about what is big behavior or what is a big behavior. So here's our um, hopefully easy to remember definition. Um, big behaviors are any response or reaction that does any of the following, okay? Any kind of re response or reaction that threatens physical safety. That's automatically a big behavior. If physical safety is threatened, that's a big behavior. If uh, emotional safety is threatened, that's a big behavior. So somebody being truly bullied, um, not just teased necessarily, but somebody who this is a chronic, ongoing, threatening situation, they feel emotionally threatened. A big behavior is any type of response or reaction that ruptures the community in your classroom. Um, our, our expertise in um, education is really with the younger children, the elementary school. Um, although we have lots of experience, particularly in our therapeutic services with middle school and high school, but particularly with the younger kids, I know um, elementary teachers spend a lot of time and energy trying to develop this sense of community and team and family in the, the classroom because that's very helpful. Um, and so anything that ruptures that, that's a big behavior. Um, any uh, response or reaction that derails teaching or learning. And that's important to remember. We're not talking necessarily about the teacher's skill level for being a good teacher. This is something that any teacher would find really derailing. So a behavior that just literally stops your ability to teach, 
stops the other student's ability to learn, we consider that a big behavior. Um, let's see, what else? Um, any kind of uh, response or reaction that keeps students from showing up as a learner. So oftentimes kids who have big behaviors tend to get in their own way because they simply can't access learning because of the way that they're feeling and responding. It's important to remember that um, intensity and duration and frequency is a big component of this. So when you're looking, you know, all of us can have a bad day. Any kid can have a bad day. So throwing a chair is a big behavior, um, no matter who does it or when they do it. But you might have one kid who has one super bad day who does this, and that is not something they've ever done before. It doesn't fall in line with their typical behavior set. Um, and so we're going to look at that child a little bit differently than somebody who's doing this all the time. They tend to be emotionally intense for a long period of time, and it's hard to get them back to sort of an equilibrium of um, feeling or emotion or uh, behavior. And then uh, thinking about duration. So if this um, big behaviors last for a long time, it's, uh, it's not just a, a quick 30 second blip. It's something that's taking you know, um, 10 minutes or five minutes and it just keeps going on. And I, I say that not because 10 or five minutes is, is a set in stone because one minute of somebody really exhibiting a big behavior can seem like an hour. So uh, you have to kind of judge this your, for yourself. Um, I also want to want you to know that lots of small behaviors piled up can be considered big behaviors. So you'll have some kids who won't throw chairs, but they'll continue to, um, you know, pick on the people in their in their group. Or maybe they're sitting together in pause. They might continually pick, and then they'll they'll take somebody else's supplies. And uh, then they'll be under the chair while you're teaching. I mean, all these little behaviors can stack up to say, you know what, this is derailing teaching and learning. Um, this is really rupturing the community because other kids are not able to pay attention. So you can think about uh, small behaviors as um, a big behavior issue. And Tina, just jump in here anytime you want to add your lens. I, um, she and I know that she'll do that, but I wanted you to know that her voice is also super uh, important and informative. So let's, um, before we move on to anything else, I think this is super important to talk about. And that is misbehaviors are not character flaws. And that's really important to remember that because oftentimes kids who have and exhibit big behaviors get labeled very quickly. And the younger you are, the more you internalize external labor, uh, labels. And you also generalize who you are in the world. So, you know, as somebody who's of a certain age, I can certainly compartmentalize myself and say, okay, I, I'm not a great artist, but um, I can tell a joke. Um, I, I don't know how to sew, but I do know how to knit. I mean, little things like that, you kind of compartmentalize yourself. And I'm a daughter and I'm a mother and I'm a wife and all of these kinds of things. Whereas the younger you are, the more global your sense of yourself is. So when I'm bad at school or I get into trouble at school, I consider myself a bad kid. If I'm excluded because I, I'm not doing the right thing, I consider myself um, as a person who doesn't fit in. And those internalized labels, um, which really are character flaws when you really think about them, can follow a kid and make a self-perpetuating or uh, what do they call that? A self-fulfilling prophecy. And so and just be careful of that. These are not character flaws. Big behaviors, if they are communication, they are miscommunication. So let's think about that for a minute. If behavior is communication, misbehavior is miscommunication. It's the inability to communicate effectively or appropriately. So it's still communication, it's just poorly delivered. And big misbehavior is big miscommunication. In ineffective communication. And what we need to think about is really behaviors tell you what skills kids still need to, um, to build. So Tina, did you want to say something about that? Yeah, so one of the things that I wanted to say just from a therapeutic lens, as you think about, Rhonda talked about internalizing these labels. So what happens is it starts at an early age is that shame begins to develop. 
because shame is a statement about who I am and not what I've done. So if I think I'm, if I see a behavior, it's bad and it's that that's bad, then I may think I'm bad. And so that shame develops. And that's one of the things that, that um, adds to the, the development of trauma. Something we see therapeutically with kids on up through adults is that we're dealing with lots of shame. The other piece is guilt, is that we've done something that we haven't been able to recover from because we feel like that we can't be redeemed from those things that we've done. And so there's something in that process of how we're addressing behaviors that can add to shame and guilt. And then the third thing I would say is what happens is that that narrative begins to develop about who I am. So now I've got this inner critic that's telling me about myself continually. So it keeps me from trying new things. So if you put something in front of a kiddo and they won't try it, they're probably listening to a critic of fear because maybe they've had a miscommunication, misbehavior in the past and they started feeling shame about it or feeling guilty about it. So this is one of the things that we really like to talk about because these things, as Rhonda said, they follow you. We have adults who are still trying to address shame and guilt from childhood experiences, much like, hey, I was in school and this happened and I couldn't recover from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a super good point. I also wanted to say um, children will pick up on how you um, intentionally or unintentionally label the child and uh, particularly the younger the child because they still are in that phase where they want to people please. And the brain is really a pattern seeking device and they're looking at, okay, here's an individual, this is happening. How, what connection can I make? And if the, if the teacher intimates in any way that, you know, you're a problem, you're a pain in the neck, um, you can't do this, you never get along, whatever is, is being communicated, children, particularly young children, will adopt that same message. And they will literally exclude those children. And so, as Tina said, that fuels the shame, it fuels the... Um, the, the sense of uh, uh, damaged self-concept. So we just had to be really careful about that. I mentioned that misbehaviors um, were a sign of what skills children still needed to build. And these are almost always social emotional health skills. So um, if you happen to go to our website, you'll find on there um, a stair-step model of, um, of social emotional health. And it starts with safe relationship. And then it goes into some um, other skill sets like the ability to self-regulate, um, the ability to understand yourself, the ability to understand others, and then the ability to make um, influence or changes in your community. And these are the skills we're talking about. So um, you might find a child who doesn't know how to take other perspectives. That's hugely important. That's a social skill that they need to learn. You might find a kid who doesn't know how to control her impulses. Again, a social skill that is really helps them in school and in life, but they might not have it yet. So it might be a good tool for you to download that. Um, it's freely available on our website. If you just download that image, that might be helpful um, to kind of look and see what, what skill is this child telling me um, that he or she doesn't have. So again, not a character flaw. It really reveals the skills the child needs to learn. So um, the next slide is unpacking the brain a little bit. And um, if you're interested in unpacking it in more depth and really looking at self-regulation, we have a whole training um, on brain and self-regulation. And uh, it's a two session training with lots of um, practical tools that you can use. And so we invite you to that if you're interested in, in that. Um, and I might mention, Tina mentioned trauma a second ago and how labeling feeds into trauma. Um, and, and she has a wonderful uh, presentation that uh, is given called Helping Kids um, Heal. I think, is that what we titled it most recently, Helping Kids Heal? Um, yeah, Helping Kids Heal, supporting okay. um, students in the classroom. Perfect. So we go through different iterations of titles and I was kind of uh, <laughs> stuck on that. So anyway, that's another training that if you were interested in, you might uh, go to that one and unpack trauma. Uh, really important, helpful information. So let's look at the brain. Um, this is going to be super simplistic and not a deep dive. Um, basically, there are three parts to the brain that really um, you can think about in terms of how behavior comes about. Um, and so the first part of the brain that I want to talk about is the amygdala, and that's that little green um, kind of almond shape um, portion there. And you have, this is one side of your brain, you actually have two amygdala. And um, that is often called the fire alarm of the brain. 
it's something that is um, activated when an individual feels fear, uh, threat, vulnerability, um, pain, shame, those kinds of emotions that really make somebody feel like, you know, something's, um, something's going to get me or this doesn't feel good. It really activates. And the thing about the amygdala, it's, you know, when you look at this, um, this uh, picture of the brain, this is way deep in the middle of the brain in the limbic system, which is one of the oldest parts of our brain um, in evolutionary terms. And so it's, you know, how you, you might know a skill, but when you are under stress, you go right to the, your, what you know best. Um, that's like the, the, what the, uh, the amygdala does because it's so old we might know better, but when we're under stress, we'll go right back to the amygdala and the amygdala will take over. And the amygdala's job is to feel, not to think. And it basically sends stress hormones to the rest of the brain and the body to say that, you know, red alert, red alert, something's going on. Um, and then you see that, that backward looking C, it's that purple part on there. That's the hippocampus, which really is in charge of our ability to learn and remember information. Um, it's also really tapped into emotional memory. So uh, oftentimes somebody has a really, um, and it might be even buried back there, but you have a, a memory um, of something that happened that was really emotional and something could trigger that pretty easily. Um, and then you have the prefrontal cortex, which is right here behind your forehead. And the prefrontal cortex is the newest part of the brain. And it's the last part of the brain to actually develop uh, in, in adults. It doesn't develop fully until you're in your mid-20s. So it's an important part of the brain in terms of your ability to pay attention, to focus your attention, to make good decisions, to control your impulses, um, to read social cues, all of those things that help us to be really effective social beings. It's all in the prefrontal cortex. And so um, it's important to remember but to think about what does the brain have to do with behavior. If you look at where the amygdala is and the hippocampus, what you'll find is that they're close together. And if the amygdala is activated, nothing gets into the hippocampus. So you might be having a kid having a meltdown and their, their amygdala is, is hijacked and it's uh, triggered and activated. And you might say to them, listen, do you remember the rule today? The rule that we have in our classroom is you sit still and, and you raise your hand and then I'll call on you or whatever the rule is. I'm telling you that at the moment when the child is activated and melting down, they can't access the logic of that statement. And because they can't access the logic of that statement because the amygdala is taking control, they also can't access anything in the prefrontal cortex that would help them to say, take a breath, calm down, you're going to be okay. All their brain is doing is, is activating and saying, this is a bad situation, you have to get out. And it, it, it's really your fight, flight, and freeze um, and fawn, which is another thing um, that I learned just the other day, which is the um, other part of the, the uh, amygdala's uh, response system. So it's really important to remember that big behaviors often communicate the way a child is experienced in the world right now. So if something's happening right now that's setting them that amygdala off, that's an indication of how they're experienced in the world. It also could be a result of the way the brain has stored information or memory and um, reacts to the way that they have experienced the world before. And so they see either real or perceived threats. And it just doesn't matter if the threat is real or perceived. It's the perception of the individual that counts. So you might tell a child, um, you know, maybe you yell at a child, which all of us have done, right? I mean, there's not an adult who's worked with children who has a voice that I think hasn't yelled. <laughs> so anyway, I could be wrong on that, but um, you might actually trigger something in a child who has experienced you know, severe punishment after being yelled at or, or something like that. So just know that the way the brain works really does matter. And so let's talk then about um, this one size doesn't fit all. Um, when it comes to big behaviors, it's important to remember that lots of traditional uh, behavior management systems don't work for kids who um, exhibit big behaviors. Um, and so let me unpack just a few of those before we move on. Um, anything that's universal, 
um, because universal systems, and that means I have to do, you know, if I do this for um, Jimmy, I have to do it for Jennifer. Um, if it's universal, it's usually arbitrary, meaning that if X happens, then Y always follows. And if, you know, A happens, then B follows. And it's this very arbitrary type um, hierarchy. And I know that um, in lots of schools, administrators want you to develop um, behavior, um, you know, rules or consequences that follow that type of logic. The problem with that is it doesn't take into account the individuality of the person exhibiting those behaviors. And so if you can't get underneath and figure out why the behavior is here, you can't punish it away. So um, let's say a child is experiencing some sort of emotional pain. You cannot punish away pain. And I think that's important to remember. So you might have this sort of universal, I don't care what your name is student, if you do this, this will happen. And I'm not saying not to ever have those, but realize that those won't work for kids who experience and exhibit big behaviors. That's all I'm saying. So you might have to have that system, but you might need to tweak it uh, when it comes to really addressing the problem of a child who exhibits um, the type of behaviors we're talking about. Um, I'm just, oh, wait, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say that what Rhonda just talked about is actually a trauma-informed approach in your school is to look at how you're using those behavior systems because the trauma-informed approach is looking at how, how kids show up differently based upon their backgrounds. And then you're um, addressing the response based upon the context where you can get the consistency is in routines and procedures. Those are the kinds of things that allow for kids who've experienced trauma to, to know what to expect. So we can have consistency in, in much of that and some of that in those systems, but the larger part of the systems is how do I address the issue with this kid based upon their background and their experiences? Yep, thank you. Um, another kind of system to kind of steer clear of with these kids is an if then. So if you do this, then this will happen, which is kind of what I, I talked about, but even statements like that are can be really triggering to kids. So if thens don't generally work. Um, reward and punishment systems. You would think that these would work with, um, with your toughest kids, but they really don't. Um, and that's because they ignore the place that skill development has in changing behavior. So um, I have uh, two little neighbor, neighborhood girls who are learning to ride bikes. And um, one of them is older, obviously, and their sisters, and uh, she's on a two wheel. And her little sister is on a tricycle, not a tricycle, but the training wheel things. And I was out there talking to them the other day and the little girl said, oh yeah, I just got this bike because it was my birthday and she was all excited. And her older sister said, yeah, when she, she can take the training wheels off, grandpa's going to give her, um, I forgot it was like a gift certificate to Chuck E. Cheese or something like that. I forgot what the reward was. And while that's all well and good, it doesn't matter what the grandpa says he's going to give her. If she takes those training wheels off right now, she's going to fall over because she hasn't developed the skill to balance yet. And so this is the same thing. If somebody hasn't developed the skill to take another ch child's perspective, for instance, or to um, feel compassion, if without that skill development, you can try to reward and punish the heck out of it and you're not going to move forward because it's you're not paying attention to what needs to be developed. And then finally, public systems. Um, shame is never motivating. It does not change behavior in a positive direction. And so be careful of public systems like clip charts, where a kid is moving their, their clip, um, depending, you know, in reaction to their behavior. Um, these are actually really triggering to kids because they feel it, it just exacerbates the shame that they might feel. So um, knowing that these kind of trigger big behaviors, uh, instead, think about what the child is communicating and what social emotional skill would help them to communicate more effectively or avoid or solve the problem. So that's what really the focus needs to be on. What are they trying to communicate? What social emotional skill will help them to communicate more effectively, number one, and or avoid the problem next time and or solve the problem they're having? That's what's most important with your discipline policies. So the last thing I wanted to mention is that this tiered model, and we all, you know, educators know this tiered model um, from instruction. 
barred from um, English language arts for many years. And um, we can superimpose um, behaviors onto this RTI model. And for those of you who, if there's anybody on this call who doesn't know what RTI, it stands for response to intervention. So it's really this triangle, it's talking about the interventions. And um, what we know about uh, superimposing behaviors onto this model is that tier one is hopefully the largest segment of your student population. Um, these are the kids who are developing um, developing on track, they're developing physically, cognitively, emotionally, socially on track. They tend to be pretty um, easily redirected. Um, they, they go with instruction, all of that kind of thing. I'm so sorry. Thank you for telling me that you couldn't see the side, uh, slide, uh, Marie Claire. There it is. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and so this should be the largest segment of your, of your student body. And so they will exhibit behaviors that we consider needing tier one interventions. And they're simple, they're, they're routines and procedures. Um, and so here's what we know. Um, well, let me, let me move on before here's what we know. If you look at tier two, those are behaviors that require deeper interventions. So you might have to have small group instruction or this might be a child who's going to need some prompting before you're going to do a transition or um, you know, going to need to break things into smaller steps, whatever the intervention is going to be, it's a little bit higher than what a behavior in the tier one would be. And then you have your tier three. And oftentimes these are the behaviors that are big behaviors. And um, these need really intensive specialized support. And that's where you need to advocate for mental health um, supports, um, you know, for children, for all children, but particularly for kids who need tier three support. Um, that's really important to do. What I wanted to say about tier one is, um, and this comes from lots of experience working with campuses um, and as a teacher myself, um, I know that if you don't get your tier one interventions, your routines and your procedures in place, then I think you're gonna have more problems with tier two and tier three because that stabilizing force really helps um, children to function at a higher level. So that's where you're gonna start, okay? So we, um, we do wanna get into questions um, and answers. So thank you, for, Tina, for keeping time for me. I can talk about this for a long time. So any questions that we have, and we can obviously answer the questions that were already sent in. If you all will put questions into, you can use the Q&A feature or you can use the chat. We'll try to monitor both of those. Some people like one over the other, pick your poison. We'll, we'll, we'll get to both of them. What we'll do is since you all are here live, we'll answer those questions and then maybe we'll um, intermittently go to some of the ones that came in before um, today's training. So we'll kind of go back and forth. As you're thinking about this, Rhonda, why don't we um, look at um, some of the ones that came in before the training and maybe answer a couple of those. Um, I know there was some questions about just like classroom management and parent stuff. You want to go toward the parent questions? Yeah. So uh, I don't know if you want to, um, let me, let me get that open. I had something else open. So you betcha. Um, so there were quite a few questions about parents um, and about virtual learning and how parents plug into that. So kind of handling these um, together. So lots of you are saying things like um, you're having trouble getting kids engaged, they're turning off the computers, they're walking out of rooms, um, and parents are up to here. They're, they're stressed, they're frustrated, um, and you're just not sure what to do and how can you help parents. So I think that's a really great, um, it's a tricky problem, but it's, it's great that you're, so many, so many of you leaned into that because we, you know, it tells me that you understand how important are to success to children's success. Um, I think I would first say engage parents without their children first. So I would talk to parents ahead of time. I would have a time where we meet with parents or the instructor meets with parents um, maybe for 15 minutes on a Friday so that they know what's coming up the next week and you can kind of walk them through and help them to anticipate this might be a challenging assignment here. Um, th that kind of thing. So I think preparing parents will lower their stress level 
um, instead of them always, especially if they have multiple children, they have to figure out how to, how to navigate really tricky waters. Um, I think the other thing to do is figure out how do I engage children? And I'm not talking about all the bells and whistles of, and do use them, you know, Google Classroom, the Jamboards, the Slido, all of these things are great to use, but engage them relationally. So have times where you're checking in with children one on one on one each week so that they are maintaining that relationship. It's a lot harder to turn off your computer when you have a real deep relationship with the person on the other uh, behind the screen. So think about that level of engagement, um, developing that relationship. Um, anything you want to add to that? No, I think what you said is great. And I think, you know, we, we talk about having like these faculty meeting. I know you're probably having a, a challenging meeting with parents one-on-one, -on -one, but just wondering if there's a time to be able to just allow parents to come into a conversation with you, just to have them do some decompressing and de-stressing. Like what are ways we can support you at home? Um, and you may not be able to do all those things, but sometimes it's just a matter of letting parents be heard and gathering them together in a space because there's a lot happening in home spaces um, just as you know, there's a lot happening for you as teachers and administrators. The stress levels are off the charts. And so we're going to have to think of different creative ways to engage parents unlike we've done before. So it may just be scheduling something for them just to, hey, just coffee break or whatever it is, just to have time to hear from them and let them just talk about what's happening and maybe do a little bit of solutionizing, but mostly giving them a chance to just kind of express what's happening in, in their own personal spaces. I think this uh, question from Marie Claire is um, right on point. And so I'm just going to read it to you. I know it's in the chat. Um, are there support uh, for tier two level behaviors we may see more often when we return to schools? And then this is where I think her question gets really interesting. She says, um, maybe things we might need to use more like tier one to support students because students and their brains haven't been used to being in school. I'm worried students might be more easily triggered and less uh, skills with their social awareness relationship skills. That last part, I think you're dead on. When kids come back to schools, I do think there's going to be much easier uh, triggers. Um, I think they're going to be much, much closer to the surface. Uh, Tina, did you want to talk about that? It's kind of your wheelhouse. Yeah, so let me, let me just address something came up in the Q&A about the replay, the recording they're making available up to a week post the, um, the training. So um, you'll have access to that for a period, a short period of time. Um, and thinking about how students are going to show back in the school, this is one of the things that we've really been talking with administrators in particular about as they are thinking about, you know, campus goals and what they're looking at in the midst of everything that they're having to juggle is really thinking about how are we going to support um, the, the needs of students, especially as it relates to trauma. Everybody's experiencing trauma from the pandemic and especially parents and teachers and students as you think about trying to navigate the space at home. So what are some of the, the pre-planning that can happen as students come back in? I think school, the way that we do school is gonna look a little differently. Maybe it's spending a little bit more time doing regulation than you might've done in the past. Um, you know, So it's taking more frequent breaks and um, giving students a chance to do some regulation and you doing that together in the classroom. So it may be some of that. It may be re-looking at discipline policies. And as Rhonda talked about, how are we going to address these behaviors um, and the way that we go toward those and approach those is going to have a huge significance about how that child shows back up in the classroom and whether that behavior will continue or if there's re-triggering for that. Um, so I think it's thinking about overall just in your classroom if you're a teacher what are some ways that I can help to really uh, support these behaviors? Let's do some regulation and some, pre some prevention on the front end, especially for your tier one or tier twos. Again, for your tier threes, you're gonna get, have to get support for that. Um, that student needs some more significant support. And you'll have to advocate for that because a lot of times we hear from teachers in training, the kids are being put back in their classrooms and they don't have that additional support. That's hard on the teacher because again, those big behaviors disrupt that learning. They derail that learning that Ron is talking about. So it'll really, you know, um, pull on you to do some of that um, advocacy and support. But I would go toward two things as a takeaway, more regulation in your classrooms more frequently throughout the day, um, ensuring that you've got some good systems and routines in place and giving kids a chance to just kind of come down um, throughout the day so that their nervous systems can be regulated so they can get into that prefrontal because it's the nervous systems when they're amped up, that's when those behaviors come out. 
I know uh, one person put a question here about how do I help um, families and also kids lower their stress level, especially in the morning. Having morning meetings, even if you're doing it online, is super important because it helps them disconnect from the chaos of, you know, transitioning to school and having breakfast and getting your backpack, whatever it is, or virtually getting up, getting your breakfast, uh, getting everything plugged in, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that morning meeting is, is a routine that really is helpful in regulating um, emotional responses. And other things about regulating, breath is really important. So teaching kids how to breathe, um, using um, your body. So stretching is really regulating, um, using progressive muscle relaxation, which is where you just intentionally um, uh, clench certain muscles and then you intentionally and slowly release those muscles. So there are lots of ways to self-regulate. Um, I think that's super important. Yeah, one, one more thing is, you know, of course, Rhonda mentioned all these different things, but movement is so important. So even if you're taking a break, it's doing some silly movements and having a little fun together. Right. Singing, you don't have to wait for music class. Humming has a vibration um, that it causes the system to calm. Um, so you'll see a lot of their therapists out there that do a lot of humming and drumming, which is the somatic work, what we call dealing with the senses in the body. All of that's helping to calm. So you can do silly stuff like, hmm, we're going to hum our ABC or whatever it is that you want to do. You can be creative. This is because you guys are so creative. Teachers are creative. So use that for your regulation strategies. Um, yeah. Art, we're going to draw, or we're going to paint or whatever that is. Um, as part of your lesson for that day. And this is cool even for older kids. They like to do silly stuff too. So um, it's just, you know, being allowed to hit, take all the giggles that they're going to do as you're explaining it because they'll think it's so whack unless you give them a chance to create with that. But use all of those options to get the senses and movement involved. How do you help the student if parent is showing no interest in reaching the student's goal or not showing any involvement. You want to stab at that, Rhonda, and then I'll... Yeah, and so, you know, this happens virtually or in person, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's an old tale, right? This happens all the time. Um, and so we're not blaming parents. It might be that the parent just has nothing left to give because their life is so chaotic. Um, advocating and being, stepping in the gap for that parent is what really great teachers love to do. So taking on the role of, you don't have this support, so I'm going to be here to encourage you. I'm going to be here to um, help you break things into steps. I'm going to be here to help you figure out a timeline to get your, you know, your assignments done. I'm going to be help you organize. So this is a lot more taxing on the teacher. I totally get that. If the child is older, pairing them up with an older child, with a peer to help with that is important. But think about if you switch places with that child, what does the child need that they're not getting from the parent? And how much of that can you build back in? I think another thing is to think about, talk with the child. Do they have a close grandparent or aunt or an uncle who might be able to step in and support them um, through school? Because even if you do all of that stuff, you're only going to be with that child for one school year. So is there somebody constant in the child's life that can help them um, navigate um, academics? Because that's super important. And then I also wouldn't leave parents out. I mean, um, you have to continue to have respect for their role as a parent and at least informing them, even if they do nothing with it. Because uh, they might come around at some point and you want to make sure that they feel included and valued as, as a parent. Yeah, and I would say that, you know, I think one of the things that we get asked a lot is about relationship building. I think one of the questions that even came in on the pre-question group was, you know, how long does it take to build a relationship with a student? Um, you know, it could take your full year and then maybe the rest of the time that they're in the elementary school um, that you teach at. It could take all of that time, depending on what that child is experiencing. And we have kids going through some horrific things. And you think about how the pandemic has exacerbated disparities that were already there. Um, and, you know, I'm seeing so many different things, a couple of communities that I work with that have historically um, experienced inequities. And there's so much happening trauma in those spaces. And so when it comes to that, it may take a little bit of time. Um, but one of the things that I would say is don't give up on the relationship, especially with the parent, because if the child is experiencing challenges, the parents are experiencing probably the same level, but at a different, of course, um, development stage, clearly. But I think just simple touch points like for a parent is here's what, you know, we did with, with Johnny today. 
thanks so much for being there for him. Thanks so much for, for caring for him. Just a simple something to say that you're speaking into the resilience of that parent because that parent is resilient, regardless of whether they're engaged or not. There's, there's, if we chase the why, this is one of our strategies. If we chase the why for a while, we probably could come up with some reasons why that parent is showing no interest. That parent may be dissociated. They may be so overwhelmed. They can't get to that in that space. They may be in that amygdala and have been there so long. They may have mental health issues of their own. They may be dealing with addictive behavior. There's so many things that we don't know. So it's just tapping into that resilience with just some basic one line statements that we give to that parent and just trying to build that relationship. You can only control your part of it, but at least there's an attempt to connect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, systemic support, I think is really important. Um, there've been quite a few mentions of that in questions. Um, I think you do have to have some sort of systemic approach to big behaviors, particularly behaviors that are um, threatening safety. So there should be a team on your campus that responds when you're having a crisis. And that needs to be something that's developed with the admin team, maybe the counselors, um, where they say, you know, if you have something happen that threatens safety, you will phone this person or text this person or whatever you use walkie talkies, whatever. Um, and this is what will happen then so that you every teacher knows that I think that's really important. Other lower lift systems would be tapping in and tapping out. So if you're an administrator, allowing your teachers to um, tag you and say you are another administrator or, you know, uh, somebody else on your campus who can say who can come into a classroom and fill that space for 10 minutes. Just let me tap out for a minute because I, I just, I, I need a minute. So lots of teachers are exhausted and totally up to here uh, with stress and stressful adults don't do well with children. And so tapping and tapping out will be a lower um, lift that you could do. Um, and what I found with them, principals who use this is that it's used a lot at the beginning. And then once you, you know, it convinces teachers that they're felt, heard, seen and valued um, that starts to reduce their stress. And so they use it less often uh, the more the year goes on. Um, there's, there's a question in the Q&A. Did you see that? I did. It was a thank you for talking about that replay. Let, and let me just add to the, the support, especially as it relates to the stress of teachers. Um, we are offering a training this month. We have two training. One is called the Five C's of Teacher Mental Health. Um, and we're going to talk about the stressors that teachers face, and we're going to talk about strategies for that. So please join that. We also have one the following week. So the training is on uh, March 23rd um, for teachers. And then the following week, we have one that is uh, geared toward and targeted toward administrators. It's called um, Building uh, Cultural Wellness. Um, but it'll be centered around kind of those five C's, but what administrators can do in particular to think about an overall um, campus wellness. We encourage you to attend both of those if you can. You can register online through our website. And we've got some slides at the end to kind of give you that information where to go. But um, clearly as we are, the, the adults in the space are co-regulators. And so if we have this little um, statement that we put in our most of our training that says dysregulated adults cannot produce regulated students. Mm -hmm. And our dysregulation is around our own stress levels and our own trauma that we're dealing with. And so how do we stay regulated so that we can support the regulation of, of kids, even in these difficult um, experiences, even as teachers are struggling to stay in the profession, um, we want you to be able to know how to deal with that secondary trauma, how to deal with the stress levels that you're feeling so that you can show up the best that you can for your students and help to co-regulate them toward being able to, to manage in the classroom those big behaviors. Um, just another real quick theme. Um, they're talking, some of the questions uh, relate to not just supporting the student and the teacher, but the class. And so when you have a really big behavior, this really is distressing for the other students. And um, it can trigger their amygdala to go off and to disconnect from learning. So the smartest thing that I think, or one of the smart things I think you can do is to purposely disconnect from learning at the moment so that you can get everybody's brain back to regulation. And I think it's important to mention, this was hard. This, this was a really scary thing for all of us. Um, and 
you know, Jimmy is going to the office. Um, you know, not like you have to talk necessarily about him, but um, Jimmy needs some help to, to calm his brain, calm his breathing, and he'll be back and feeling better. Something, you know, depending if you're, depending what age you're teaching, you know, those types of things. Um, but having said that, I think you do have to address the elephant in the room. You can't just ignore it and, and move on. Um, so you, this is a teaching opportunity. So if you feel really frustrated, what could you do instead of, um, you know, a big behavior? And you might not need to say instead of throwing a chair like Johnny did. I wouldn't say that kind of thing. But I would say, what do you, you know, we all feel frustrated. What, what do you do when you feel frustrated? So you're normalizing the feeling and really bringing out into the, the room the strategies, the many strategies students use. And that's a really great teaching opportunity. And then the other thing is when you're bringing the kid back in to the classroom, you need a way to kind of help them transfer back in. So you to, to reintegrate and to join the learning. And so I think that's a really important point, not to just, uh, you know, come sit down type thing, um, but welcome them back in the classroom in a way that doesn't make them feel like they're sticking out like a sore thumb. Um, We've got um, a question that came in. We had actually a series of some questions that were around culture and race. And so we've got just a few minutes left, about six minutes left. So we're going to tackle this one and then we'll close out with some, um, some, some slides just to give you some, some resources to connect to. Um, what are some current strategies to address various cultural differences? This is huge because we, we know that, um, that issues of race and culture affect our society, which means they affect every system and every entity that we interface with. So it's in our school system. I think one of the challenges that I've seen in, in doing some training, talking with administrators and, and various teachers is that cultural competency and cultural responsiveness, these are the, the terms that we're using and these are our focuses. And in fact, we really need to begin to name the core of the challenges, not just culture, because culture is really about beliefs and traditions and um, uh, norms that we hold within certain groups. But the issue really is race. It's the, the, the um, physical characteristics of someone that, it, that we've created labels for in our country. And we have a lot of history and historical implications around race that we really haven't addressed. And they've made, they've been a part of education for years, segregation, which when we've tried to, um, you know, desegregate schools, race has been the factor. It's not been about culture. So one of the, the main things we have to do now is we have to start naming race as a, a factor to address in schools. It's not just culture, but it's race. And how do we address the implications of race in, that have happened over time and how it's showing up in our schools, in our um, teaching um, or teachers who show up who may have experienced race and racial trauma, which is we're talking a lot about more now since we're starting to see some of these upheavals um, in our communities that's been there, but we're starting to have the conversations. So the first thing I would do is say name the fact that it's not just culture, it's race. We've got to address those issues that are creating trauma for different groups that are coming into the school. And then the second thing is, another strategy is that campuses can begin to have people come in and start helping them understand more about racial trauma and, and how those implications and, and how those are showing up in classroom and in discipline practices. And then the third strategy I think would be addressing where we are with our own racial identity because you can learn everything you want about a culture. We've been doing these things in education for years. Um, you know, you can have Black History Month and you have single Month. You have all these areas, these different things you can learn about culture. But if we're not addressing racial identity and understanding how trauma has been attached to how we view race in this country and how it shows up in practices and policies and systems, then we're gonna keep having these conversations about well, let's do this different with cultural competency. So I wanted to add that we've got some great resources that we can drop into the chat. I'll add some in as we're kind of closing out. Um, and we'll make sure we send those out to you via email and we send the, the, the slides with the big behavior definitions and those things on there. Um, right. I know you probably want to add some things to yeah, that. Yeah, I just, I just added an article that might be helpful. Um, so we wanted to kind of give you a, a, a sort of a, a preview of some additional trainings and resources that might be helpful for oh. you. Um, the first one is uh, we have a wonderful blog that we add to every week, um, both from the therapeutic services professionals and educators. Um, we would love for you to contact or to, to connect and join our blog and get some 
really great um, practical tools and strategies. Um, I know you already know this site because you've already registered for this course, but this is where we register for any other um, trainings that we have and um, that will continue to be populated. Um, this is on-demand trainings that we offer. So these are pre-recorded. Um, they're very reasonably priced, $19.97 for each, each one. So uh, we have 10 of these, they're one hour, and you can receive CPU credits for those. Um, and then, um, and by the way, if you're an administrator, they come with viewing guides. So if you wanted to show one to your faculty, you can use your viewing guide to lead discussion. And then uh, we do have an e-shop um, that gives lots of classroom tools, including some books, um, posters, uh, activities, um, mini curriculums, and a full-fledged curriculum as well. So just wanted to give you those. And we so appreciate your time and attention today. Uh, we want you to keep in touch and um, join us on our uh, social media platforms um, and not be a stranger. We, we, we love to link arms and, um, and work with you. So uh, thank you so much for being here today. And thank we you all. have a great rest of your day. Take care, y'all. Thank you, Bailey. Thank you, Marie Claire. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for being here. We can't do these training unless y'all come. So we thank you guys for being here. <laughs>